I'm a true believer that, you know, nobody could tell you what poetry is. But at the end of the day, writing and, and like any art form, you develop your own creative practice. Nobody could tell you this is not art. Uh, nobody could tell you this is not poetry, this is not prose, because there are no, in reality, there are no rules. If somebody tells you, you know, you, your poetry is only good for your little circle, which is, in other words, that's what they said. It kind of encouraged me, challenged me to go beyond Tahar, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. How are you doing? How are you, Nori? I'm good. Good to finally have you on. Finally got you. Are we going to pretend we <laughs> pretend we did have a pre-introduction? We had a pre-introduction, but I think we have to talk about how difficult it was to book you down because of how busy you are these days, uh, even for your best best friends, uh, which is uh, your best friend is me. Hasan's a friend, but I'm like your best friend, if I'm not mistaken. So that's true. That's true. E- even then, it was still hard to book you uh, to book you in, but it was really a privilege to, to finally have you on. Uh, I'm just so it's a privilege to be connected like an astronaut <laughs> discussing, <laughs> discussing poetry of my best friends. Tahar, we've obviously uh, kind of seen your journey uh, over the past uh, 10 years plus, mashallah, and, and the way you, you're, you, you're blowing up recently is, is, is really uh, inspiring. Um, I want to like backtrack just to the beginning. Um, I think that typically, you know, growing up when you think about poetry, it's not something that, you know, someone people who grew up in our circumstances really lean towards uh, you know it's, it's probably the most least interesting subject, subject for all of us in school the most boring subject in school it, it's not something that's kind of like you know seem to be uh, cool or whatever so what was it like at first that kind of pulled out that that poetic uh, uh, craft that you have out of yourself what was the first kind of experience where you thought okay you know what this is something I'm good at it's something I want to use to express my my emotions a good question. It's uh, a bit of a remix of previous podcast questions. By the way, I haven't seen uh, any, any other podcast <laughs> with you, just letting you know. So it's, it's not my fault if we start from the beginning. Oh, will oh, forgive you. Uh, but sometimes I feel like I should record this segment. So every time I jump <laughs> on into an interview, you can just play it. This is how my poetic journey began and where no, it stemmed from. But the thing is, uh, it's deeper than that. I'm not just asking about your journey, how it began. Like, like when was it yeah. when you, as, a, as, as, as you as your character, you realized... This is how I want to express myself rather than any other uh, form of, of art and medium. So basically, take us back to when you were 14. I said there is. 40, well, 14, 40 14. or 14. 14. <laughs> I got worried. I, got worried. <laughs> I was like, I, I know I'm not that, not that tight with Hasnam, but look, if he thinks I was 40 when I started my poetic journey, then that's worrying. Um, so, yeah, let's go back to when I was 14, secondary school. Um, It'll be interesting to see if Hasnika relates because I don't know what kind of educational background uh, you had in New York. Uh, but it's not English literature, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> so, me and Nori, uh, so... we both grew, uh, grew up in, in West London, um, which is different to obviously East London, Northwest London, and other parts of London. And it had its own kind of demographic, um, ethnic minorities in particular. So, the focus academically in terms of education was on old English poets. So I remember being in an English lesson and the poets that we were reading, majority of them were white and English. Um, You got the odd few, there was uh, a few, you know, colored poets uh, there with, you know, and and they had like a notable um, kind of shout out in the anthology, but there wasn't anything- And always about race as well, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that famous half caste poem that we, we all get taught. Um, but yeah, there was nothing that stood out. Obviously, poetry is a is an, a personal expression, so we have to relate in terms of accessibility, relatability. There was nothing for me as a fourteen year old to read and say, you know what, this is what I want to be. I want to grow up to be a a poet um, because I enjoy reading the poetry coming out of these mouths uh, or pens. So. I had zero interest. So my obviously my first exposure to actual poetry was through English, uh, English lessons. Uh, but I would say the driving force behind what forced it into being a creative outlet for me was actually rap music. Mm. Um, so I grew up uh, and recently, so I was discussing this on another podcast and I was, I was mentioning how people around me and close friends like Jamal Edwards, who has recently passed away, um, 
were, you know, influential voices and people around me at the time. Uh, so I grew up, um, if we go back um, through history to when I was 14, I grew up on the same road, the same area as Jamal Edwards, wow. who went on to um, set up his own thing. But And then not only that, I was in the same primary school, in the same class, same secondary school class. And so that influence was, was there. I had a, an array of talent around me, whether it was rap music, <clears throat> artists or people trying to explore music in in odd ways and i couldn't you know explore that because there was the whole taboo of you can't get into music um although i didn't have that kind of explicit conversation with my parents but i knew deep down that that wasn't something that i wanted to touch for personal reasons um but i enjoyed the way they were wordsmith the way they manipulated words and poetry in their portrayal of what they see is life uh so i think that planted the seed and if i didn't credit that influence i would be a liar mm. uh but it was many years later i think it was i was 15 at the time it was year 10 or 11 um and there was one poem in the anthology uh, it was called titchborn's elegy and i don't want to repeat it because i've mentioned this on a, on a different podcast and in other interviews but it was a poem written by a Catholic and it was written 500 years ago when Catholicism was outlawed. Uh, but it's an interesting poem because of the backstory. So you've got now a Catholic who's been charged with um, being a, an activist of sorts. So he was sent to London Dungeon and back then London Dungeon was like worse than Guantanamo Bay, pretty much sentenced to death uh, a few days later. Um, but he was given a sentence. So he was to be uh, executed. Um, and I think his sentence was disembowelment as well. So wow. really ho horrid stuff. Uh, and in his final moments or the night before, he wrote a profound piece of poetry, which is titled um, Tichborn's Elegy. And it discusses the fragility of life and you know how one day you're alive and the next you're you're in your grave but it was such an honest portrayal of life and death that i was struck by how raw it was yet how po uh, poetic it also uh was in the sense that the metaphors used and the poetic language was so deep that he he must have taken a lot of a long time the night before his death to to piece it together and i found that extremely beautiful and that triggered my first um exploration of poetry but then beyond that we're looking at religious poetry here because the first poem i actually shared was on a on a forum and, and nori probably remembers these I poems wanna, because uh, we, uh, we uh, yeah. I, I do want to get into that not, not, not to cut you off but i want to kind of like get off yeah. that point because what's interesting was there's, a, there's kind of a connection between that emotion you had then and recently when jamal passed away you were obviously yeah. you know it wasn't easy for you uh, as it would be mm. for any of us, you know, just a, a childhood friend and, and kind of having that reality of death thrown onto you. And then I noticed that you posted a poem on Instagram about uh, the fragility of life uh, soon afterwards. Mm. So what is it about, like, uh, the way your kind of creativity has become now that whenever you go through something or you experience a, a weight of emotions or, or, or something, you know, heavy is on your chest, the way to kind of alleviate that or to express yourself is through poetry. How have you... Uh, kind of come to be wired like what is your relationship with your writings in the sense that it now uh, almost is your way of grieving is your way of, of taking that emotion out of you and expressing it yeah at first um, that's the beginning if we go back to the beginning it was a, it was just a creative outlet so when I felt inspiration or motivation that was my outlet really but recently it's become a therapeutic outlet um I've, become, I've started to write so often, which wasn't the case before, that now I seek my own kind of self-therapy and self-reflection through poetry um, without, you know, without coming across as some sort of sage or anything like that. It's just the way, you know, the way I'd like to express myself. I often, most of the work uh, that I, I do write, it doesn't end up being shared because it's very personal. Mm. Um, but I do, you know, tend to kind of claw something out of the, the notebook and share every now now and then if I feel like people can benefit from that um, but yeah like you said that was a poem that I felt could relate to and portray and exhibit how I felt about the fragility of life because losing a close one 
um, close friend um, is hard yeah. because obviously distance when, when you know somebody from secondary school and then but beyond that and you communicate you create this distance between yourself but when they pass you realize all you had was memory so you, you kind of you know you're dragged back into that childhood that, version of those yourself. memories are, are such innocent ones as well because they go back so early into your life right yeah yeah so you, yeah you're dragged back and 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 now you can only relate their life and death as a, a scary yet profound thing um, and that's why I try to tackle with with, with that poem in particular. Um, but yeah, I can't remember the que- your question now. Was, was, I, think I, was I, I think that was it. I was trying to get the answer out of you. Has I'm going to gonna, go gonna, jump in because I have a million questions. Um, yeah, go on. Since we're on the topic of, I guess, mental health, um, yeah. you know, in, in today's world, you know, everybody's going through something, right? Um, yeah. Everybody's going through their own trials and tribulations. Um, and one, and I and I noticed in your other podcast, you were talking about how you specifically gear specific poems for a specific audience, you know. And, and yeah. I, I kind of questioned myself um, because I don't see being a poet any different than, than a storyteller, than any different than an actor or a filmmaker. I mean, mm-hmm. we always have to tell a story, uh, regardless of the audience. So, I guess my question to you is: when you're in a specific mental state, whether it's it's heartbreak. Um, whether it's loss of, uh, of a loved one, uh, whether you just feel like the world's heavy on you. Um, is your outlet writing, like in, in, in therapy, they ask you to journal? Because you know, journaling helps you kind of say things that you normally can't say to somebody. You know, I can't tell Nuri I hate him. I can, I can write it down, you know? You know? <laughs> but uh, uh, is that something that has been... A, a theme in your in, in your poems because we know the religious aspect we know the identity aspect we know all that aspect but every time I read something that you post um, for me I only relate it to what I'm currently feeling now so whether it's, it's about religion or, or God um, I only I only let the words that want to hit me hit me and is that is that like your goal is that something you've been cognizant of or is it something that you just write and whatever the audience takes takes I think it's a bit of both. Um, if we're going to be honest about the process, the process is, is quite difficult because obviously you want to write for yourself. So I've made it my ultimate goal to write poetry that helps me first and foremost. But then when you're being a poet, you have to also have that artistic nature where you create poetry and use metaphors that other people can relate to and, and expand and make it more accessible. Um, so when you're trying to be as selfish as possible by using it as a a therapeutic outlet you can you also have to be as selfless as possible as well because you can realize somebody's going to read this and if i'm going to share it i want to make it as accessible as possible so it's a a balancing act i would say Uh, and oftentimes when you're writing about specific theme the balancing becomes easier uh, because you're targeting a theme that people already know and uh, already they've got that prerequisites as well so they come into this um so so say uh, let's give us an example of if there's a specific event that i want to write to they kind of geared themselves a day in advance or or just moments before they read the poem so they are they're, they're sitting in that mindset so it's it's working for them in that instance but yeah no everyone likes different types of poetry and i've i've, I've realized that the hard way is because I often thought, you know, people like a specific type of kind of spiritual reflection, and that's what I used to share. But then I thought, you know what, people follow me for all types of reasons. Some people Mm want to delve into heartbreak, some people want to delve into the Arabic language, some people want to delve into, you know, me grappling with my own language, which I've I've realized is a genre in itself that I, you know, I don't know if I created it, but already exists because of the whole second generation first, uh, second and first immigration uh, immigrant generations and um, we all you know struggle with our our mother tongue so there is a, a genre and a theme for that um but you yeah, know it becomes a bit difficult because you can't as a poet um you often have to cater for different audiences right. and we no matter how we spin it we've become public figures in a way which is unfortunate because it means that we have to think of others as well as ourselves. Like, 
but poets are generally selfish people uh, with egos, uh, I'll have you know. Um, so now we're sitting in a, in a pool where we're thinking, oh, shall I write for other people or shall I write for myself? And I've, I've answered that question recently with just write for yourself and if people right. appreciate your poetry uh, and can relate and resonate with it, then great. Uh, but that also means from a publishing angle, and here is where it gets a bit interesting, uh, because now I've got intentions to publish a book. I'm sure Nuri has intentions to publish a book. Every other poet, you know, dreams of publishing many books. Uh, but what the, what should this book contain? And that's a question that we often ask each other, uh, ask ourselves. Um, and I've come to realize that each book uh, and this is my philosophy here, and, and I don't know if it's going to be a success. We'll have this discussion in ten years' time uh, if I end up with a, a bestseller or not. But Listen, I'll just... buy ten copies right now. <laughs> the thing is, you'll be, make it best... you'll be much harder to book then. So let's have the conversation now in advance, and then we can <laughs> record it and we'll air it in ten years. <laughs> so, it's, so, so the experiment I'm testing is separating each genre into a book itself. Uh, and thankfully enough, I've, I've gathered enough publisher interest to to potentially publish three or four manuscripts that are completely different from each Amazing. other, um, which is, yeah, it basically separates everything you see I share on Instagram, but these are poems that haven't been published before, um, or some of them have actually, uh, but it separates the genres. And now this can hopefully appeal to everyone that likes a specific type of poetry I write. Um, yeah, which is which should be exciting, but I think that answers the question of how I separate and dissect um, the poetry and, and whether yeah whether I'm thinking about it in the moment. Well, one thing uh, which you are sorry, Hasnik. One thing which you, one thing which you are kind right. of, I think. Uh, I knew you were going to say something besides that. <laughs> one thing I think which you are like leading into, um, and one thing which mm. I think you're very successful in. Um, you know, uh, as you know, in the kind of the community we grew up in, there's only one kind of poetry which is part of our heritage uh, as our religious mm. identity which is poetry about the prophet and his family and you know commemorating their births and deaths and it, it's a very rigid kind of system which we kind of follow which is a beautiful one because we remember you know our religion that way and and, and these great saints mm. uh, that we have uh, in our faith i think one thing that you have become very successful at is basically creating an audience which where like you said they're following you for different reasons now you know even though you you kind of I don't want to say you come from this, but like you you were once uh, part of the system that we have where a poet recites for the Ahlul Bayt, and that's kind of it, right? Where I think you actually mm. once told me that the way it actually was in the past was that poets used to recite generally for all kinds of topics, and also they recite for the Ahlul Bayt, which I think you're very successful at. Now you're 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 in a, in a in a in a place where you have a great wonderful platform, mashallah, where people are following you, not just for that poetry, but for all kinds of poetry. Um, so I guess what I wanted to ask was, what, how did you kind of um, create this, uh, uh, let's say, community online that you have now of people that are following you for different reasons when it comes to your poetry, and yet they all appreciate it. So you have, for example, non-Muslims that are appreciating your poetry about the Ahlul You have, for example, uh, you know, non-Muslims that are even appreciating your poetry about uh, the God, nine ten names of God. How did you kind of, um, was that a, a specific like step that you, you, you intended to, to take a step out and say, I'm going to create this community, which is inclusive, or did it kind of like come about um, in its own kind of, you know, uh, trial and error kind of way? Yeah, I'd say just like most life experiences, the outcome was accidental. Uh, but when, when something when something works, it works, right? Um, I, I can I can I can detail how the journey came about. Um, so obviously, I was I was writing. So me and Nori started writing probably the same period during the CYC forum. So there's a forum, 2008, yeah, 2008. Because I remember the first poem I wrote. So yeah, it was 2006, shared, yeah. like those those years, basically. Yeah, yeah. those years, yeah. Um, I mean, during the financial crisis, we're <laughs> supposed to write. So. <laughs> there, there's no money involved, right? <laughs> That's a thing. P pure times. Uh, yeah, no. Be, being a poet means you're going to be broke forever as well. So might as well <laughs> milk it while, <laughs> while we're getting the likes, right? Um, so yeah, go, going back to the very beginning when it comes to uh, uh, the, the journey, 2008. Um, I'm trying to remember... Did it begin in 2008 when we started sharing? Uh, yeah, it was, it was 2008. Uh, so we, me and Nori, uh, I'm, I'm involving you here, Nori. So it's going to be a, 
uh, an interpersonal conversation. So we started sharing very specific poetry, like you mentioned, um, and that attracted a certain audience. Um, and then I started delving into other things like um, God and, you know, uh, reflections on life and death. Uh, and I kind of, you know, accumulated this all into and compiled it all into a manuscript that I was building over the years. Um, I know Nori stayed, you stayed uh, active on social media, whereas I, I kind of dissipated and I kind yeah, of disappeared. Yeah. So I had like a 10 year period where it wasn't because I was thinking, oh, I don't have an ego. I'm not going to post myself online. It was more, uh, I just felt like I was really comfortable, you know, compiling a manuscript. Uh, so I put all my poetry into this book, which we now know as Lost and Found, has an end. Reveal the book, sh show it to the world. <laughs> so there's a book called Lost and Found. And, and this I have a signed copy. A signed if anybody copy. wants to buy it, if anybody wants to buy it, triple the price. That's, yeah, that's crypto for you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, um, we're going to get into NFTs in a bit. <laughs> NFTs in a bit. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm loving NFTs, by the way. I don't own any, but... But somebody draw me, please, because I can stick it as a Twitter profile pic. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so I compiled the book. Uh, and and when it was launched in 2018, I thought to myself, let me... Actually, I had I had a social media profile, but I'd post once a year or no, once every even six it, months. It was like a personal account, wasn't it? It wasn't even like a public account. Yeah, it was, it was a public account. <laughs> so I, I, I locked my personal account in 2020. So during the pandemic or just before the pandemic. Uh, but yeah, so after I launched my book in 2018, so now this is a book that contains all my poems from 2008 all the way to 2018. And obviously for marketing reasons, I needed to put out there. That was one. Uh, and the second reason was because I now finished compiling the book. So now I could have a social media presence. There was nothing to distract me. Uh, so I dedicated uh, a few hours, less than a few hours, a few minutes um, a week to sharing three pieces of poetry or was it four so every other day uh, and i decided to start my social media journey uh during covid times again so the first journey started in the you know the credit crunch uh so the downfall society and the second downfall society that's when i kind of instigated and uh started my social media journey um and so that's where it kicked off uh, and obviously that coincided with me doing my master's in creative writing and poetry. And this this was the real eye opener for me because mm -hmm. remember me and other poets, we come from a very, very small niche bubble. Uh, and in this bubble, we think we're the greatest poets in the world. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're put, you, you know, you're, you're put in an academic environment mm -hmm. and somebody looks at your, your poems and you're like, there's, you know, practically in, in facial, uh, and body language tells you this is rubbish. Mm. And I, my poems were critiqued the hell out oh, in the first hard. couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, and my ego, and Nuri knows my ego, when it comes to poetry, you can't be doing that to me. So I was like, nah, I don't believe this. Uh, but then I started participating in all these, uh, what we call in, in, in academia, these kind of poetry workshops where you read other people's poems and you critique them based on what you've just listened to. Uh, and then you you try to give advice, but the catch here in these workshops, you're not allowed to defend yourself. And again, Nuri will confirm that I I love defending myself. Uh, so now I'm told to shut up <laughs> and listen to yeah. So listen to critique of people from different backgrounds, and and obviously the vast majority inside a you know uh, a creative writing course uh, would be middle aged white men and women, and now they have. You know, a specific liking to a certain type of classical form, and I'm coming with pure blown freestyles, yeah, uh, bigging up you know saints and imams and you know things they're not even you know familiar with. They like the you know the fact that they needed to search for those references. The mystery intrigued them, but it wasn't a poem or my the poetry itself wasn't accessible for a wide English audience. Um, right. And then that made me realize that that's just one audience. And these are people that are passionate enough to study poetry and not just study poetry. They're passionate enough to read, you know, advocate and, um, you know, propel people within the poetry sphere if they like you enough. Uh, so I went on a journey to see where I could, you know, 
create this bridge between the academic poetry world and the the poetry world that I was part of. So so trying to you know bridge mainstream with specific spirit you know spiritual Islamic elements. Um, and I thought and I think I've reached uh, a halfway house where people can relate from both ends, where mm-hmm. people can appreciate the poetry for the poetry and others can appreciate it for you know the elements that they you know they crave and desire. Um, so that's the journey. Uh, and, and here we are with a multitude of different audiences, which I think, you know, they mesh quite nicely together. But it also means that some, you know, if I release a book tomorrow about, you know, Islamic figures, which I plan to do, mm. those people that I met in the academic courses won't really buy it, won't really read it. Uh, and I can't just mix and match and because it loses its value. You know, at the end of the day, a collection needs to be a poem in itself. So those are one of the professors at UEA uh, mentioned that, and, and I find it profound ever since that the collection as a whole should be a poem. Mm-hmm. Like somebody should be able to, you know, open the book at any point and know that this is a poem that comes from this collection, mm-hmm. not because of the words of the poet, but because of the theme of the book itself. Um, so that's why I hope to create with with various different manuscripts that are on the verge of um, publication. One of them is to be translated into Arabic before the English, which is quite weird, but also exciting because it's a book about the Arabic language being mm. translated into Arabic, which is a, it feels like a reverse move, but it's, you know, it's quite interesting. Mm. I'm going to step in here real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, you know, to unpack a lot of that, you know, going into, you know, your your degree and then understanding that it kind of has a, a force against how you freestyle, right? Right. So, mm. you know, Nuri can speak to this when it comes to screenwriting. You know, when we write, when Nuri writes a screen and he's like, it's the best thing in the world. And he gives it to a screenwriter and he, tell, he you know, Nuri's like, right. this is that, not, that, there's no structure that's to the, this. That's <laughs> happens, right? this that's oh, we love these exposures. <laughs> we'll take it on the WhatsApp group. <laughs> <laughs> So like, you know, it, there's a big, there's a lot of correlation there um, in regards to, you know, taking constructive criticism, right? And and I think that that when we hit a professional peak, which is kind of where all three of us are, um, it's vital to the growth of our kind of art, right? So I, I guess throughout your journey, what I'm trying to ask is, although there were, it was a room full of white people that didn't really understand where we were coming from. Um, it's the same thing in film. I'll just put it out there. Is there is there some tough pills you had to swallow where you had to unlearn to relearn that's, what that's you needed a, to do? That's an amazing question because that's exactly what happened. So, yeah, no, the begin, at the start of the journey, uh, after the critique, after I swallowed that you know humble pie, uh, <laughs> Uh, I realized I do need to reinvent the way I write. Um, it wasn't really a reinvention. It was more of an understanding. Uh, I had zero understanding of how classical forms worked in poetry. Right. For me, you know, people like me and Nuru, both of us, we're, we're blessed with, with with imagination. We're blessed with the idea to kind of invent a metaphor uh, and use it. But when it comes to self-taught poets, which we were, um, it's all just kind of making it up as we go along and we strengthen our skills and poetic uh, skill sets as we go along naturally, like any self-taught artist. Uh, but then you're told, because these are experts in the field, that there's actually right. you know, uh, a process behind this. There's, there's forms you can learn that you could also unlearn, but through the process of unlearning, you become a master at your craft. So I had to sit down, learn, what we refer to as poetry theory, uh, which is, there's a book upstairs, I should have brought it down. It's a massive book, probably this big, um, and it just specifies poetic theory. So it's got all these historic poets that have written essays on what they perceive as poetry. Remember, poetry is a murky uh, term because some people refer to prose as part of poetry. Some people differentiate between prose and poetry. Some people see any sort of poem that goes outside the forms of classical form, outside the the, the structure of classical forms as not poems at all. Uh, but obviously you have to learn why. 
and their think and the thinking behind it to understand how to work with inform and once you understand how to work with inform and i don't want to get too technical here, here but you also learn how to break out of form in a way that satisfies a professional uh, audience or or keen eye so th- there's there's people out there that have professional jobs called poetry uh, poetry critics wow. that i did not know so they write in 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 newspapers in journals and all they do and they're paid for this and they, and they you know they're normally professors as well at universities where they look at the craft and structure of your poems and the language used and they critique you you know with a microscope like wow. literally that's how far they'll go in uh and so in order to avoid <laughs> the critique of these uh crazy people you need to understand <laughs> how how to create a structure and break out the structure in a nice way it's like music uh if you right. can enter a musical remedy a uh, le- uh, remedy like melody um and break out of it naturally and I, i'm i'm making this up because i'm not a musician i don't know how it works but you've seen how the experts and the pianists they they kind of slowly ease themselves in and ease themselves out and that that's how they create new forms uh, and and that's how they become original um so i had to learn that i, le- I had to cuz i didn't want to be stuck in classical forms i didn't want to be that poet who you know can only write you know sonnets or soliloquies right. you know i i had to i had to learn form uh and these are classical forms and there's a dozen of them uh, and then learn how to break out these forms and and through that i've created you know a free verse technique where i stick to an invisible form that nobody knows but i know if somebody else would look at this they would say you know what he stayed within the line the line breaks are perfect and that's me and my ocd here speaking but and, and most people i'd say 99 point i didn't know this so but 99.9% of people wouldn't realize this when they read my poetry but um I think you know I, I've also got other target audience you know for, for publishing reasons like if I wanted to publish in a journal I'd want to be able to take this poem and say you know what this is a poem worth publishing and these journals are normally you know the editors are are normally critics um I hope that answered the question uh but you yeah, know it it definitely you know changed the way I saw poetry because for me it wasn't uh, an art, it was just a self expression and at the end of the day spoken word in, p- in particular it has no rules poetry at the end of the day no matter how many rules i've just mentioned here has no rules That's but good, yeah. if you want to become a professional when it comes to you know submitting to literary magazines and journals to be accepted by very big public uh, publishing houses which i haven't yet but um so so just to go back to that since that experiment I've been published in 26 literary journals and magazines. So that just shows, you know, once you start getting into uh, understanding how form works, it actually does pay dividends. Uh but yeah, it was it was a very interesting um learning experience and curve for me. Uh, and I wasn't aware of this and I think that's why I always encourage other poets to kind of un- research poet uh, other po- uh, poets research how they see poetry, read poetry essays. Uh, but no but it's, it's such a boring task like you know if i try to convince 25 year old me to do this he wouldn't do it like it had to take for somebody to tell me you know what go on this course and we're paying for it which is a scholarship uh for me to be you know convinced so of learning what did how. what did push you then to 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 cuz the thing is you know you know how you talk about like like feedback and criticism and stuff and, and you mentioned something which is nice that poetry kind of has no rules and the the thing mm. is like you know we started talking about how you know when jamal died like your your first kind of reaction was to write a poem about him right so like poetry becomes you know as, as i know very well part of your your being and your essence right so when someone yep. comes and criticizes it of course they're trying to make you better but sometimes you you know when you're when you have such a connection a deep connection with something you're like well i wrote this from my heart are you trying yep. to tell me that my heart is wrong do you know what i mean like like yeah. at, what, at what point so what what i'm trying to ask you is that at what, at what point did you kind of like had to step over that call it ego or call it a protectedness of your own inner self and your own inner creativity at what point did you kind of realize that okay i've got to step over this what made you think that now i've got to step over this to improve my craft basically what was the push because it was that same week i started that course um and just a disclaimer here because i am a true believer that you know nobody could tell you what poetry is at the end of the day writing and and like any art form and creative outlet uh, 
you develop you know you develop your own creative practice nobody could tell you this is not art and uh, nobody could tell you this is not poetry this is not prose because there are no in reality there are no rules uh but for me i reached a stage where i had a bit of an ego hit uh and if somebody tells you you know you, your poetry is only good for your little circle which is in other words that's what they said um it kind of encouraged me challenged me to go beyond uh, and prove to these people um so it's, it's out of arrogance partly uh, that i i could write in a way that would appease my audience and appease your eyes and i also realize um that you know if you want to to seek poetry at a professional level uh you have to do certain things um just like you know at the end of the day when you're you know filming a short film that perhaps is less less rules than than shooting a film that ends up in cinema i'm, I'm speaking to, to two filmmakers here so i'm trying <laughs> to create an analogy that you can relate to um but it's it, that's what it was for me i wanted to prove that i could become a poet at a professional level to be published at the highest you know levels and literary magazines um and and you know i wanted the message and the topics and themes that i was exploring in my own inner circles to come out to the world as well so there's you know characters historic characters islamic characters that haven't had the limelight in you know mainstream publishing so for me that was a milestone you know i've got say you know abbas ibn ali uh, ibn, ibn ali abi talib so i've got a poem about him and his life and his struggles and his you know tragedy published in an anthology which would be read by predominantly non-muslims and for me that was a milestone because if i was put on earth to do something it would probably you know to propagate all these stories and you know retell all these stories and propagate all these messages to a wider audience um and since then i i believed in accessibility i believed you know the greatest power you can have as a storyteller as a poet is to you know uh access the minds the ears of people that wouldn't ordinarily be interested in your work because there's you know th- there's a lot of blessings um you know sharing your poems and being read by people like you because they can relate it's easier for them to relate but if somebody that is nothing like you reads your poem is moved by it you know has his own epiphany and it doesn't need to be you know directly related to god uh, spirituality islam per se but if it changes them then you know you've done your bit in, on earth because you've created a piece of artwork that has lived beyond you um so you yeah, know that's where i see where my poetry fits inside the grand scheme of things um we're all blessed any anybody that has a creative talent is is incredibly blessed uh because everything we put out in the world changes the world you know it's a yeah, you know snowball effect yeah, um sorry go ahead no, no. I finish I, I said there's a lot to unpack there i kind of just had two follow-ups to that mm-hmm. uh, that i really want to pick your brain in there's one thing you kept saying um that people were saying to you and they were referring to that, that inner circle right mm-hmm. uh, if you look on instagram today the inner circle is no longer an inner circle. It's, it's like a kind of a yeah. massive, I mean, everyone I know on Instagram now is like a Muslim poet out of nowhere, <laughs> right? So the talent is expanding. Um, you know, you've created, you were one of the, the few people along with Nui that created a community of not just Muslim poets, but like, you know, if you see your social media and, and your activities, you're making a community for others to come into, you know? Um, can you just talk a little bit about that, how that come about? I know... I think True Hashim is his name as well as also another really phenomenal poet and he does the whole Arabic and English and uh, kind of how that took place. Yeah. No, no, another disclaimer. When me and Nuri were 16, we didn't sit down together and decide, you know what, we're going to open the doors for every other poet to go <laughs> in. It wasn't the grand scheme of things like the Illuminati. It wasn't, you know, that we didn't have an agenda. But but we... Can't mention their name on this podcast. <laughs> can't, can't do it. Is, is that how it works? I, I work in a specific <laughs> industry, you know. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't walk into they, work. They pay him, bro. Don't let him lose his job. Uh, they they pay me, man. We love them. We ask him. Keep paying as them. Whatever you're paying, double double up. Uh, but no, no. As in me and Nori, we didn't have anybody doing this before us. Um, right. 
which is, I guess, a blessing and a curse. A blessing because we got to pave our own way in ways we saw fit. And that flexibility, um, and nobody was judging us because nobody could say, oh, no, they were judging us you know, against Arabic poets. You can't really judge an English poet against Arabic poet. But uh, that was the only you know, barometer, the only me- measuring stick they had against us, right? But we would, we, me and Noor were practically freestyling our way through our, the start of our journey. Uh, and obviously throughout the years, you know, we, we saw other poets come into the fold as well. Um, but w- we were stuck in our own bubble. And I think it was a blessing in that sense, because whatever we did was praised and praise at the start of your journey is the best thing. And I know Nuri's going to look at me like this because I critique him a lot for other reasons. Uh, let's not use the word I've, critique. I've, okay. Let's <laughs> use the word <laughs> fight. Criticize. We fight, fight each other a lot. Uh, I, I, I'm of the opinion, and I don't know if this is the father in me, you know, that, you know, the proper Arab old school father. But I've, I'm of the opinion that what we see in Islam is what you, you let them do they whatever break. they, <laughs> you, you let, you let them do whatever they want in the first seven years of their life. Right. And then you beat them with the shoe of the other, the first seven. Wait, well, we're not advocating any violence here, but I'm just, I'm just paraphrasing it's a metaphor. We're getting it. What, okay. <laughs> the cult. Yeah. So. In the first seven years or first God knows how many years, I think praise is very important because a lot of it is confidence. We all have these innate talents, this desire for creative outlets. If we can somehow encourage a person to, with praise or with a, or any sort of encouragement, then that is the best method for any creative out there. So when you see somebody, they could be a 40 year old. If Hassanen tomorrow wanted to be a poet, I would praise you for seven years. After and then years. I will criticize. I will criticize every <laughs> bone of you, uh, but then I I am also a firm believer that once you've reached that stage where you've got people praising you enough, that's where you should pop you know the big head bubble, uh, and deflate that ego and start to work on progressing your creative practice, whether it's uh, poetry. And and I had to do that inadvertently. You know, I didn't know this was a thing until you know I was criticized. Um, and, and it might, you know, stem back to my own experiences, but I think there should be a balancing act with self reflect as a creative, it's very hard to self review, uh, and critique your own work because we're in love with it. That's our ego. We've but, all sort, we all, do you know, it's time yeah. just to kind of like stop you. I, th- I think it's, it's more than, th- than that in terms of like, it's more than just your relationships <clears> or what you have. What it is, I think is when you're continuously writing, let's say for example, your whole life. And we both yeah. face this at various times where it's like you hit a brick wall at some point because yeah. you, either, either you're writing the same or like, you know, you don't see yourself progressing in any way. So automatically you're going to have to evolve. You're going to have to be ahead of, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know, yourself. I don't say the competition ahead of yourself and improve. And when that happens, you you not only improve your own craft, but you bring everyone who's along you, uh, who's following following you just generally in life along with you for the ride so every time you recite a poem every time you you create a, a spoken word track or you write a book every time you improve you are bringing the journey, the readers and, and, and listeners of your poetry with you uh, along with you so i think it's, it's deeper than just you know critiquing whatever it's just a general you know uh uh it, it's very important that whoever's writing like if anyone's watching this to get some advice about writing it's very important to push yourself and be different and unique all the time and like yeah, you yeah. did for example you you are already mashallah like uh i know, I know you you're, you're trying to be humble and, 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 and you know anyone who's listening to you uh this uh podcast might think that before two years ago your poetry was horrible but you were already published if i'm not mistaken before uh, two years ago right you were in a few you'd won competitions before like you weren't you know it, it, it wasn't like you were uh starting off from nothing like you were already very ahead of the game uh, and even then you decided to push yourself and, 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 and push yourself even more. And what happens then, as you can see, is you're given, uh, you know, your, your community that's, that's with you is, is, is more, you know, your, your community grows because you're pushing yourself and they notice that. The same yeah. way that when yeah. you started to write more, not more from your heart, but when you started to use your poetry and your, for your own kind of therapeutic desires, because your heart's on that paper, it's going to reach more hearts, right? So I think it, it's more just about always trying to be ahead of yourself, always trying to grow in different ways. Um, I think that's very important. I think it's something you've done also very successfully as well. Sorry, carry on your point. I just yeah. jumped in there. To, no, no, I think that's so. a very valid point. Uh, self-realization is a powerful tool. I know Nuri has that, but there's a lot of other creatives that they get, you know, they get stuck in a rut and they don't realize. Uh, and identifying when progress is needed is, is very important. Um, but you yeah, know, it's, 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 
it's, it's needed to self-evaluate, you know, work out when, when should I improve? How should I improve? Uh, who do I seek? Who do I read? Um, and I've always advocated that all poets, you know, end up reading other poets at one stage in their career, because I didn't, and I still does there, you know, I, I struggle to read other poets because I can't relate to their work as, as much as I'd like to, but it's not about relatability here. It's understanding what, you know, what other poets do and how they do it successfully. Mm -hmm. And if you know how other poets are successful, you could incorporate not in a, you know, mirroring or mi mimicking style, but you could incorporate the elements and the poetic tools they use into your own work. Um, so that's what I learned, you know, the hard way. And, and, you know, it's also encouraged me to read. I wasn't a big reader before, you know, three, four years ago. And I started, you know, uh, you know, started on a, on a reading journey, which, which helped me as well. Yeah. So, um, that brings up a really good, uh, question because from the beginning of this podcast, you mentioned how rap and hip hop was a huge influence on you. Um, and then, you know, you were going through basically your upbringing, right? So like my upbringing in New York was a lot different, right? Like we didn't have much English literature here in New York, right? So the only poet I know that stuck with me since childhood was like Langston Hughes, right? The poem Dreams um, has been with me, but that was kind of the, the poets that we were being introduced to because where I grew up from was a heavy, heavy black and African-American neighborhood. Um, so again, you know, hip hop, uh, being here in New York was a huge influence, not just on my art, but everything else as well. And then if you fast forward, you, you know, right now you're saying you're, you're reading a lot of books, you know, you're, you're definitely getting back into that type of stuff. I don't know if it's novels or, or, or if it's like mysticism. And I know I, you spoke about you liking some mystical stuff that we don't have to talk about. But... I was going to scare the listeners. That sounds really weird. This is... <laughs> for, for the record, I'm a fan of fantasy novels for me I'm, yeah. a, I'm a sucker for fantasy um, and that triggers my imagination but carry on with your question I just <laughs> wanted to put this clear yeah, you're way too, I'm not into you're, all those uh, has been voodoo, your, voodoo stuff you're way too ambiguous yeah. about that for no reason you could have said fantasy novels yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know how to like, say it I'm not into voodoo whatever he's gonna say about it. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know how to work so basically I guess to the point was over your growth it seems like the content that you were taking in has evolved how does the content you take in affect what you write? That's an interesting question because I've always tried to examine whether the content I've read actually manifests itself in the poetry. Uh, the short answer to that is yes, because I've discovered, you know, when I started to read Arabic poetry uh, and, and more Arabic works, I was more intrigued about the Arabic language. It was deeply now embedded you know, the exploration was embedded in my subconscious uh, and that is obviously through the reading that i'd done over the past few months before you know conducting that you know writing uh so the short answer to that is yes and long term i believe you know if you end up reading a lot of imaginative work that also expands your imagination i i don't have any science to back this but I believe imagination is a muscle in itself, a very intangible muscle that doesn't exist. But the more films you watch uh, of a certain genre, the more uh, books you read, and the more you delve into your imagination, it kind of becomes a spontaneous, not so a, a, an automated act after that. So whenever, I think, I don't know about Nori here, but imagination informs a lot of my poetry. If I'm in an imaginative state, I can write more readily. It's very in sync with my creative juices, if we can call them that. So if I've just to watch an epic uh, film about space or uh, watch a series or read a book that, you know, is set in medieval uh, Britain with elves and dwarves, uh, I tend to write more readily. Um, I don't know if that again you know can be scientifically explained but i think reading always does strengthen your writing obviously you've got the right. the, the english teacher coming out of me now where it's vocabulary to begin with uh, i think that strengthened turns out the english teachers uh, are right because, the whole time we still yeah. call them no, right. <laughs> it, 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 just to just to you know give you a bit of background 
being brought up in West London means your vocabulary is near <laughs> zilch. So I, I know we come across as as English right now, but we are re we are really bad at English compared to the rest of the UK. That's true. Uh, we can't articulate ourselves well. We struggle. Uh, so the fact that we're poets is a miracle in itself because <laughs> we shouldn't be able to articulate ourselves on paper. So I, I struggle verbally, but on paper, I tend to be more articulate. So if you want to have an argument with me, never have a verbal argument with me. So Let's what do you think about Americans then? Uh, uh, you need to read more <laughs> <laughs> as, 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 as a nation. Um, but you know what's interesting? But you know, you know what you think is that, is that, that it, 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 people who grew up in art, like end of the woods, neck of the woods, they weren't unintelligent, which is, uh, I think, what you, yeah, know, no. you know, the, the road smart. It, yeah, the road smart. It's like, it's like, it's like you have mm. the, you know, you know, you, you say you grew up on hip hop. Some of those guys are incredible wordsmiths who done horribly in school because they weren't interested in, in, yeah. in school. I, I think yeah. they, they may be creative uh, and, they're, and they're incredibly intelligent, but it's interesting that they you know, the kind of the tongue itself, the, the, the language that we were speaking is very, uh, <laughs> it leaves a lot to be desired. It, it, uh, no, it's very concentrated. Sure. It's it, we basically like to squeeze a lot of words in minimal words. Uh, like we, we only need three or four words to explain our mood on the day. 100%. You know, conversation. <laughs> like, or one word. Three, so they, <laughs> 100%. Um, but that does impact the way you articulate yourself. Unfortunately, um, we. I only realized when I, you know, went university the first time around, not the second time around, uh, that I speak quite different to everybody else we are, i obviously have like an arabic tinge to my accent back then i probably still do as well here um but everyone else in more you know affluent areas was well spoken naturally because they spoke proper english yeah uh, but with the same token the most creative people often come from this disenfranchised poor broken english backgrounds uh, so the rappers a lot of trauma come from these people <laughs> it's not it's not just a, pro, a trauma it was just the creative element um and and i think and I've, I've kind of i've got this theory it happens across cultures as well so even when we look at um certain communities in iraq for instance in bahrain it tends to be the people with poorer backgrounds with the the less educated that come up with the pioneering creative for uh, become pioneering creative forces and then they're, they're the ones that revolutionize the creative arts and you know, whether, whether it's recitals or poetry. Um, and I don't know if that's, if there's a desperation element, obviously sometimes, you know, the only thing you have is a creative element because you don't have any, yeah. um, anything going for you. Uh, but, uh, well, it's a strange phenomenon. It's like, it's almost like, a, 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 you know, kind of divine irony. It's like, here's people that, you know, that can't really speak properly. But they're all, they're also now the most creative people. They're the rappers of the world. They're the poets. Now, if you look yeah. at contemporary poetry, that's where it gets a bit interesting because now we look at the academic sides of of, of saying the, there's this divide now. If we look at the Romantic era, so the Romantic era is the Victorian era poet, the poets. You know, the Keats of the world, the Percy Shelleys. Uh, so these were the you know the greatest poets of their time, and they came you know from middle class or upper class backgrounds because they were the people that could you know read and write. Uh, and often people, you know, the, the lower class and working class backgrounds weren't able to read. But now we're in a, in, a, in a position where every class can read. Every ethnic background has access to certain educational elements. Uh, so now all the contemporary poets that you read now tend, you know, the popular ones tend to come from ethnic minorities, uh, poorer backgrounds. Uh, and you rarely find somebody from an upper class, you know, white background which is not because the limelight has shifted and made them more. Yeah, there, there's that, you know, there's an argument for that as well. But the greatest contemporary poetry has shifted and now it's in the hands of people that would often be labeled as inarticulate. Mm. Um, that's amazing. So, you know, it's uh, it's an interesting thing. Again, I'm coming with theories Beautiful. and that's my my favorite thing. Theories are unsubstantiated. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I'm sure somebody will listen to it and make it a study, hopefully. But you, you Let know, me know, tag me now. <laughs> you know what's interesting? It's, it's like, it's, it's almost like growing up without having, uh, growing up with, with a large chunk of your life almost missing, be it, for example, wealth or, or, or language or, you know, the same circumstance that all of us grew up in. We kind of yearn to fill that, that gap with something, be it, you know, creative arts or, or you know, f filmmaking, poetry, writing, uh, or whatever kind of passions we have. I think that that might be why 
people from our, our neck of the woods uh, are more creative i would argue and just generally even if they're not more creative they're more interested in art i would say as well they, they yeah. consume art differently um which i think is is really uh uh they don't pay for it though that's they, don't, they don't pay for it but you know so that, I, one may argue I'm, ha- that I'm happy deserve it more. i'm happy for poets to come out of of our end but whoever's <laughs> paying for my book please come out from the other end the more <laughs> affluent it is. That's, that's the people we need <laughs> that's me, go ahead. you know in, interesting interesting you mentioned that do you see do you see a shift of artists who like like myself like i, I have to keep my full-time job to to strive or to pump into my art is that something you do is that something you're seeing a shift in because at least here in new york everybody's an artist um but everybody also has like their day job because yeah. without that without that bloodline their art is basically not not existing at this point you know yeah i i'm in the same boat uh right. most of us are in the same boat uh the same way a male you know 60 70 years ago could be the the primary breadwinner um it's become a case where it's not just that it's you have to hold a job to be an artist nobody pays poets we're not living in the 1500s where you could you know get a grab a, a bag of gold every time you recite a few beautiful lines about the king um or, or in you know or in you know the golden age of arabia poets were the richest people like i i wish i lived in that era you, if you're a poet your tongue was practically golden everywhere you go you were paid and it's an embarrassment yeah. not to be paid so if you, uh, let's just look at arabia for a second but i'll, I'll answer your question it is really really interesting so so before you know, pre jahili uh not pre jahiliya time so yeah, pre islamic yeah. era um and we and we're thinking about 50 60 years before the you know the advent of islam um if a poet were you know was declared a poet in his tribe they would throw up throw a party as lavish as as a wedding and it's like basically the coming out of a poet you come out and you, i don't know how it works i don't know how they declare a poet you know if he drops sudden bars they're like oh my god the poet is a poet so they celebrate singers dancers and you know all the local tribe comes to honor this you know coming out of a poet by by you know tribute you know at you know gifting money uh gold camels their daughters uh everything you can imagine is gifted to this young poet um for coming out as a poet uh, so th- th- that's the value old society had on artistic expressions whether there was you know ballad singers you know there wasn't any filmmakers unfortunately back then but primarily <laughs> for artists I mean, back then I'll, also, be, I'll be the tellers. king back then yeah, poet, sorry poet, you you your po- po- poetry back then would a... be a, a a court jester poetry back then was a form of storytelling right so essentially they were the almost the filmmakers of their times they, they were storytellers so that's saying you're I a suppose, poet you know, I, I now crown you a poet you've been crowned a, of our tribe as a poet it's yeah. my party Sorry, yeah poet. no but, but as in the good the good thing about filmmaking now is it can in most cases if it's taken seriously become a full-time job right but but if you're you know in in the journey and, and like me you know the bread and butter of my earnings comes from my day job right um and even when i done my masters in creative writing and poetry that was a part time gig it wasn't you know it was me taking time out of my day job to pursue it so it was a sacrifice on that end it was a financial sacrifice a time sacrifice but that's what i needed i needed something to tell me you know what i'm paying for this in a in a weird way because i'm sacrificing my time um and and that's also when you know it was the same time my my son was born as well so i was sacrificing a day that i would spend with him you know to you know propel what i thought you know and i wasn't doing it to propel my career because i didn't know it would propel my poetry career i was doing it because i felt like it was important to progress my poetry um so yeah no i think it's very important that everybody with that has a creative talent seeks some sort of seriousness in, in what they do because you know we could get dementia like tomorrow like i'm i'm talking talk about very That's real bleak, yeah bro. That's it. Wow. <laughs> no no i'm i'm just i'm i'm just saying like you know it's a gift at the end of the day and let's yeah, be real sure. and raw here uh, tomorrow we could be in a financial state where we don't even want to look at poetry because why because you know what if world war 3 happens tomorrow you reckon i'm going to pick up a pen and write about the bombs that are dropping i won't be doing that i don't know bro i think, I think that's, I, that's, precisely what, that's precisely what we'll do 
to deal no, with no, the trauma. No, no, you'll do it. You'll do it if you're in a bunker. But if you're trying to save your life, that's not going to be at the tip of your mind. A lot of us will be immediately hit by trauma, um, first and foremost. And you know the mental impact of such an event happening that you wouldn't pick up a pen naturally. I would find it hard. Um, like I said, I've been through grief in, in you know my short life where. It hasn't been the first thing that I picked up. It's been something I've reflected on, sat down, you know, multiple days later, you know, as th- as sort of self therapy to write about. But it's not been something that I would say, you know, what, in the heat of the moment, this is what I'm going to write. And that's why, in a weird and wonderful way, the poetry, the art, the writing, the memoirs, the journals, uh, everything that comes out of war is the most beautiful because it's the most real. And I hope whenever, ever, you know, in that, you know, circumstance. But, and I don't know the reason we started speaking about war. <laughs> I'm trying to remember it's, the reason we started speaking about because Russia's about to invade Europe, that's why. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. And, and, and tickets are cheap. So, yeah, get your tickets before. <laughs> do, do, you, do you think that, um, you know, like, like you mentioned, like, you know, the most beautiful uh, poems come out of war times. Is yeah. it written by those who are the victors because you know how you know history is written by those who, are, who yeah. are the victors versus those who are affected like what's your thought on that i think what we've seen uh, and what we've witnessed and what we read is is oftentimes it's the oppressed right even right. uh it, but then again it depends like say world war ii your the victors kind of the victors kind of took over the writing the memoirs you don't get any nazi poetry i don't know maybe in germany you do Maybe there's like old poetry, but I'm sure they've hidden them. As in, if it depends how crazy your dictator is and how much, you know, the future tries to hide it. I don't want to imagine we're in a situation where, God forbid, Boris Johnson decides that he wants to be the biggest dictator on earth. And then as a consequence, our poetry is sanctioned through association. Like, yeah, yeah, no more Nori poetry. Wait, wait, when you say our poetry, a, yeah. I live in America now. This is your problem. Your poetry, yeah. <laughs> but it's more likely to happen to you. I and mean, you know, you've got the craziest leaders there. Uh, but yeah, you know, as in, we've seen it happen with Russia now, where uh, Russian, you know, historic Russian poets, philosophers are now, you know, censors. You know, what have they got to do with, you know, Putin? Right. Uh, right. So it's, 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 it's because, they, it's because they move the people, the... their words move people, their words mobilize people, you know. No, it's, so it's, it's not, you know, historic. His, yeah, no, historic poets have nothing to do with that, though. You know, at the end of the day, when you censor a nation, and I'm getting into politics here, based off, you know, the current actions of a dictator, I'm not, I'm not even saying he's a dictator, you know, current actions of a political leader and entity is crazy. Uh, I, I think art uh, as a whole should be separated um, from, you know, political, geopolitical uh, agendas, you know, you know, at the end of the day, it's nothing to do with. I know, you know, politics informs art most of the time, but if you take the art, look at it, dissect it as an art form, away from you know the agendas and, and ulterior motives, that's when you realize the beauty of of that piece of poetry or writing. Um, and I hope we're not involved or embroiled uh, or cancelled for our associations with the heinous act in the future. Whoever whoever starts bombing from the, from the UK, we have nothing to do with it. All I'm trying to do is write poetry here. Uh, but then again, it's, that, it's our ego at the end of the day that wants immortality right, as well. Right. We as humans want to create something that's immortal. And I think that drive comes from a, a natural thought as well because our soul wants to be immortal. So everything we create wants to live on forever. It's just our human drive. Um, but God, you know, at the end of the day, you know, immortalizes good acts. And How if you, our poet, po- you know, our poetry is a good act, or be immortalized, uh, hopefully, as books that are purchased in the hereafter uh, for much more than they are <laughs> How worth you, right now. <laughs> How do you stay humble then? How do you stay sincere? Because you, you mentioned that it's very interesting. Like the, the the soul has this desire to become immortal, and I don't think necessarily yeah. that is always. Uh, an egotistical thing. I mean, you can want to change the world for the better to live, you know, to, for the world to be better long after you're dead, right? That can be the most selfless thing. So you personally, how do you keep your ego in check? How do you stay sincere when it comes to, to writing poetry and sharing poetry? Um, that's an interesting question because we all know we all struggle with ego. 
Uh, there's times I've called Nori egoistic, and these times <laughs> he's called me egoistic. By the way, and so it goes yeah, back and this forth. This question is just is a, like a rebut, is like a like a payback for that. Uh, sorry, go on, Carol. <laughs> so, well, you know, as in from a personal perspective, I think we have to firstly recognize that we all have ego, and creatives have the biggest ego because we use our ego to create you know it works right. both ways if you can't really be a creative with no ego I, I know a lot of people think you can but you have to have that self-belief first and foremost which normally comes from a put you know uh, you know pangs of ego as well to know that you can create to know that you can move people with your words to know that you know that god has given you a gift that is ego in its raw form but now you have to, you know, shackle that ego. How do you do that? I don't know because I struggle with, with it on a daily basis. But what I do know is what's helped me is when I write for myself, as like I said previously, self-therapy. Um, and for me to, elim- you know, to try my best to eliminate the voices that tell me, you know what, an audience might not like it. I shouldn't care what an audience like. Um, because at the end of the day, it's how I see the art form. And if I think I'm being true to myself and true to the art form, which is my poetry, then that is the best way to humble an ego from a creative and artistic point of view. But when we're speaking about it from a you know spiritual, almost Islamic point of view, um, we have to realize it's a gift from God. Uh, I think that's the generic piece of advice. Uh, if I was a scholar right now, I tell you, behave yourself Nuri. this is a gift from god and, and tomorrow Allah's like best i best mentioned thought. earlier <laughs> and like i said tomorrow you could have dementia and you won't be able to you know remember all your words uh, but we have to realize life is fragile today we could be writing poems that move well you know people and tomorrow they could be you know reciting those poems on our grave because that's all we gave them mm. um and yeah no it's, it's, it's an interesting because you know, i'm trying to think Trying to be as humble as possible, well then my ego's getting the better of me. <laughs> you know, what it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. I'll tell you what I've kind of used the the, the formula that I've used is is basically uh, mm. not too dissimilar from what you just said, which is that for me, there's been times where I'm sure you face this as well. I'm sure Hasni will get this as well. Mm. Like you get these these crazy moments of uh, writer's block where you just can't write, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you think. Or for example, you write something and it's just and you know it's not good enough. For example, um, so. If, I think that experience has taught me that this gift is directly from God and no one else. And I think that's what kind of keeps me in check is that, you know, if, if you don't appreciate it, it's, it's, like, it's like gratitude, right? If you don't appreciate that gift, Allah will take it away from you. And then, and then, and, yeah. and, and, and as you know, as a poet, life without poetry for a poet is, <laughs> is, is, is hell, right? Imagine, imagine you can never write again. Yeah. It'll be very, it's, it, it's a very difficult, uh, you know, experience to go through. Um, so yeah, yeah that, 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 that's how I would kind of like, uh, define my, my, my struggle with uh, <coughs> or how to overcome I actually I'm trying to see if I can bring it up uh, I've written a poem about the ego in a very funny way um, uh, maybe I could recite it I'm, I'm going to see again see if Go I can it. it up yeah Hasnain how do you keep your ego in check you don't do you <laughs> um, how do I keep my ego in check uh, to be honest with you um, I actually don't <laughs> Um, <laughs> I I just but, let it I just let it I just let it be. But, you know? but, you think but the thing we is, have to... by the way, I think that there's a difference between like I think sometimes not appreciating your worth uh, mistakenly falls under this idea of of of. of Can arrogance. I interject? Go for it. Can I interject? Because at the end of the day, remember when we started our journey at sixteen, seventeen, respectively, right? Yeah. And we've had probably. A decade and a half worth of praise no human can withstand that praise without developing their ego mm. uh, let's be realistic here imagine for you know for 15 16 whole years somebody is telling you how wonderful you are on a daily basis every time nori shares a poem online 30 people will tell him how amazing he is like any human that receives that even if it's you know not conscious on a subconscious level that develops a need, not even a need, that develops an ego. It props up the ego naturally. Uh, so to say that we don't have egos would be the biggest lie because even if we're consciously trying to avoid it, subconsciously, we're told we're so great that 
And that's why somebody called Tahir Adil ends up in an academic circle and he's, you know, he's hurt by people's criticism because nobody's ever criticized him. Mm. Uh, nobody, if I share a poem tomorrow, Hassan, is somebody going to write a, a critique of my poem in the comment section? No. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could be the first, but it never happened. So imagine this happening for 16 years and all creatives are in a similar kind of boat. But yeah, to get into... I don't know if you finished your point, Hassanen, earlier. But I don't even remember my point. Oh, oh my, Hassanen. yeah. I mean, I, I've I've learned from the beginning of like my film career, which is like ten years now, that you know when 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 I make something, when I write something, you know, for you, you're you're writing something for a specific audience. For me, I let the audience come to whatever I I I film, right? So, um, nine out of ten people will not like my work, but if that one person took away something from my work, then I'm a winner. You know what I mean? It's yep. not, I, I, I'm, I know going in, I'm not pleasing everybody. And that's why I have the freedom to just simply write whatever I want to write and film yeah. whatever I want to film. Because at the end of the day, um, like an ego check for me is I created something from my own and you didn't. And so at least I'm trying kind of a, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's the, at the end of the day, that's the ego. We, we have to be, we've all been fed these lines that we can tell people. Every creator says the same thing, you know. Uh, my gift is from God, and I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> uh, uh, my oh, gift it's, is from it's, God. It's more than a line. I, I, it is, it's, it's more than a line. It it's, is. it's a belief. It's, it's a direct line. It's like, it, for me, it's a very it's a, it's, it's a very logical thing. Like, you, imagine you got mm. a rope tied to God. If that rope breaks, what are you going to do? So the most logical but, but thing to exactly do. But that's exactly what my The most logical thing to by do the is to try and be sincere. The line you said is literally the whole basis so of my poem. Don't accuse me of plagiarizing so, so your poem I, now, yeah? Because I said it before. <laughs> <laughs> go, go for it. No, so, as in, we, no, we truly believe, as in what we try to do is we try to pretend to be humble. And, and, and you know, pretending is a good thing because humility is needed. But we also have right. to recognize that ego is a thing. And that's why you see every single creator, be it magi- you know, music- musicians, artists, they tend to grapple with their ego to the point where it drives them insane in one sort of a way. Uh, and it ends up being an oppression of their audience because they look down on others right. for not being as great as them. Uh, so, you know, it's definitely something that we have to recognize. And we also have to recognize that it's an ongoing battle. Um, and somebody listening to this might think, oh, why is he referring to it as a battle as if it's not easy? Um, because it's not easy. You know, at the end of the day, I am a humble person in everything I do in my life. I like to think I am. Uh, Nori is disagreeing right no, now. No, I agree. Uh, but, <laughs> on the WhatsApp group, uh, but I agree generally in life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but when it, when it comes to poetry, naturally, you start to think that you have some sort of greatness. And that is ego. And yeah, so this is what the poem's about. So it starts like this. It's not even a poem. It's just uh, some lines that I used to put together to speak about my own ego to myself. I've never read this out loud, out loud, I don't think. Maybe I've mentioned it in a poem before. But this is the first breaking news. It could be, yeah. Um, so God gave me words. <laughs> God gave me words to bend with a pen. He set my flow of ink steady and thick, a little twist and turn here into letters forming what I think. Where love can be drawn and the laws of physics manipulated, where I can pull metaphors out of orbits and place them so close to the things I love, forming explosive nebulas, but but burning and bringing burning life to dead wood that we know as paper, mixing syllables like alchemy until my words find their own destination, forming and shaping their own constellations, droplets of starry poetry, spreading light across the night sky anthology, a galaxy of beauty I managed to craft and create, simply from observing the beauty of his. Simply from observing the beauty of his, I became my very own magician, but a magician with none of his own tricks. I am no one and my gift is an imposter. And there's a, a poem that hasn't been continued, but as you can see, you know, it nice. starts with this wonderful creator, but it ends with a magician, which is a, a lowly version of a creation. Yeah, so a person with none of his own tricks is right. the best way to describe my ego. Amazing. I would give you a, a 
bag of gold, so I'll just Venmo you uh, for reciting that. <laughs> I'll give you Benjamin's instead. Like, <laughs> I guess they, the good thing we've got crypto wallets, eh? Um, oh, yeah. I, 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 I want to, to, to ask you, I guess kind of like winding down, um, mm. We joke about this. Okay, we mentioned we're on a WhatsApp group together. Uh, people are probably wondering mm. who else is in this group, but we'll leave that uh, top secret confidential. I'm not there, so. Uh, no. Yeah, Hasnain's not, <laughs> has not you know, high echelons yet. You'll get there soon, bro, inshallah. Um, <laughs> you know what's interesting is that poetry, in a way, is sometimes the, the truest part of yourself, right? And, and, and it's the, the purest part of yourself. But something we kind of like uh, discuss a lot between each other is that, you know, when you share poetry, when you're seen as a poet, you're perceived in a very certain way. You're, you're perceived for your poetry and that's, that's kind of like all you are which is beautiful really because it's 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 you know the blessing of 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 uh respect and admiration which is uh, you know a huge gem to have you know many people live and die without having any of that um but at the same time it's like sometimes there's a separation between who we are as people and the poetry that we share so for example someone might admire you for your poetry but when they meet you and sit down with you it's like oh they, they expect you to be that to live that to be that living breathing Poem, uh, poet that, that living breathing couplet that they read um, so h- how would you based on that context how would you kind of define the parameters between where you end and where your poetry begins that's an interesting question I think as a background has anyone wants to gain the reason for this question I could tell you the agenda why this, there's no, why this question it's, is, it's not just I, I, <laughs> I am hands up very different to my poetic self as in the po- my poetic persona, I, I haven't created a persona because all I do is share poetry. I haven't tried to maintain a persona. That's why ma- the majority of my you know, profile that they contain photos or videos of me being me is because I've seen, you know, I, I like to keep it pure and that's not pure intention wise, but keep my page pure with, with poetry just so right. pe- can people can read my poetry because I have nothing to do with that poetry. And you'll know why in a second, because I am, Complete. I wouldn't say completely different. I ha- I'm a normal person at the end of the day. Nori knows me as you know the troublemaker. Uh, my school knew me as a c- class clown. Uh, <laughs> you know my family know me as the big mouth. You know I've got all these you know strands of identity, and these are strands of identity that I you know sometimes do bring into the real poems. You know the ones that speak about life. Uh, so there's a, a a lot of unpublished poems that will be pub- published that will delve into kind of you know day-to-day human uh relationships and 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 my persona as, as a normal person uh, so where i end and where i start is i'd like to say that poetry is my creative best it's basically where i can distill everything that i see is beautiful every reflection that i see is deep and try to make it accessible for myself to digest and for others to digest because at the end of the day it's but poetry is a creation and if i'm not creating something new then i'm not being a real poet here if i'm just simply you know mirroring my human nature which is awful by the way uh then what's the point you know at the end of the day you know i'm you're not a poet because you know you you you, you know you write things on paper you're a poet because you create from the words you write and, and i think that's where I begin and where poetry ends is, you know, me as a person does not exist when it comes to my poetry and I don't want it to exist. Mm -hmm. I don't want people in the future, if I'm ever to be remembered, to be like, you know, but the poet was actually this, you know, this kind of person. Like, okay, people refer to Shakespeare, but nobody, you know, everyone theorizes how Shakespeare was, whether he had two lovers. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, look at his life, you're like, oh, this guy must have had a lot of heart break he must have loved the loyman uh but nobody really knows for sure right uh and and there's a beauty to that uh, especially in this day and age where you know publicity is a star uh and you could actually propel your career by showing your true cra- character like if i got on to instagram and decided to uh, and i sometimes do it you know uh <laughs> just do my hypotheticals 24 7 I could be known as that person. You know, I, 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 you know, going back to my childhood, I was known as Chicken Cottage Boy, not because I looked like a chicken, but because I, my favorite food was Chicken Cottage, where it eclipsed, as I, Nori would remember, you know, there was a time where my poetry was on the rise, but also my fixation with Chicken Cottage was on the rise. But 
people loved me more for my fixation than my poetry. So whenever people <laughs> refer to me, it was not because of my poetry, but I don't want to be in that predicament where they're like, that's a silly guy who loves to do, you know, do this and that. Uh, but we all have, you know, funky, quirky parts of our character. Right, right. And, and I think that surprises a lot of people and they actually meet me uh, because they don't see what they had, the thought image 100%. they had of the poet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> look at, look at I've had, Nori, no, 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 no I'm, not, I'm not saying with you, but even with me, like I have very, <laughs> re- very like weird interactions because I'm not, again, like like you, you meet someone who you follow on social media, not only do you follow them, but you, you're you following the this poetic creative side of them. And it, it, social media is a funny thing because it creates this whole idea of who they are now in your head. You know, you and 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 you you no longer yeah. see him as a as a person almost. You just kind of see him as as this caricature, this this kind of character that you've created right, in right. your head without you know. Uh, yeah. One of our mutual friends and, and that, always jokes about you know how at home we're not going to be sitting down writing poetry all day. We're probably lying down on the couch watching TV. <laughs> that's, that's, that's like a that's like a, <laughs> a, a part a pastime, right? But no one kind of thinks about that or reflects on that when they when they perceive when they, when they, when they read your poetry and they expect to and, and what they perceive of you when they yeah. read. You. No, they they think I'm on a tree somewhere in a hammock, <laughs> you know, being a sail with the sunlight pouring uh, on you. Look at the sun, yeah, yeah no, and, and the moon descending, like you know, the moon. They think the moon smiles at me or something. You know, that's yeah. how ridiculous. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, that's where idealization comes. I, I'm not saying I'm idealized or anything, but I think people often read poetry and think this person must be, the, you know, this type of character. I, yeah, poetry is a strand of my identity. Those thoughts are mine. Yes that beauty that I create from words is, you know, sourced from my creative mind. Yes. But they don't make me who I normally am day to day because I get on with my life. Yeah, but I take right. moments of my day to sit down and try to be as pure and, ten- you know, intention as possible. So this is where my poetry comes from in terms of po- processes. I sit down, everyone has their own creative practice, right? But I sit down and try to be undisturbed and try to be in a, in a pure mindset. Uh, and that's where my poetry comes from. So the poetry you're reading comes from that individual moment that could be a half an hour, an hour, but that's not my whole day. I've got, you know, right. there's a famous saying in Britain right now, you've got the same 24 hours. So, you know, I've got the same 24 hours as everybody else, right. um, but an hour of my day, perhaps I sit down and I'm not a sage in that hour. It's just, I squeeze my mind in that single hour. Uh, and I try to create something that isn't that is me at its purest, but also isn't me at my fullest, uh, if that makes sense. So it's like a very concentrated Right, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I just yeah. got what you meant. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's um, beautiful. So, yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah. Nice. Hasnain, any final thoughts, final requests of wisdom from our resident poet over here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, just... Uh, I think one of the biggest things, like we spoke about the small circle now expanding to such a big, you know, universe on on social media. So, you know, anybody wa- watching, whether they're they're poets of their own kind, whether they're artists of their own kind, I think, you know, I, I tell people who always ask me like, hey, how, like, how do I start? And I tell them the start is just, just getting out there, right? Like, because I think the, hard, the hardest thing for anybody to do, and me and Nuri speak about this all the time, is just like, putting it out there and just letting the world see yeah so you know but, 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 but even with the same token is you don't need to put it out there either you know right. I, I mentioned my 10 year you know <laughs> disappearance from social media not social, right. as in me not sharing is as long as you're working on your poems in an active right. way or your creative art or whatever it is uh you don't necessarily need to be pressured in putting it out there yes when it's public and social media can see it, you're more likely to be recognized. But if your talent is growing, developing behind the scenes, you could reach a stage where when you do make a comeback to social media, that you could share, like uh, for instance, the first 30, 40 posts I shared when I came back are old poems, but most people assume that they were written there and then or in that time period is even till now I share poems I've written in 2017, 2016, 2015 is because I've created this body of work behind the scenes unintentionally, Mm. but because I was developing over those years, I didn't necessarily need to be in the limelight for it to be recognized that, you know, at the end of the day, that became something that came later. So if you're, if you're listening and you're developing behind the scenes and you have no desire to be on social media, 
don't be on social media. When you when you you know come out of your shell and decide now's the time to promote why I work, yes. But if you're seeking instant promotion, which is a great thing by the way, because it propels you and encourages you to progress naturally because you receive that recognition. And some people, like like I said, uh, some people don't get that praise that me and Nuri got in our first seven years. So they need that from social media. So if they're craving that, there's I've no seen, harm. I've seen, I've seen so many folks yeah. come and go, by the way, over our years, and it's very sad. Uh, yeah, you know, because they have the time. It's not, it's not strengthened. At the end of the day, you need encouragement, and you need constant encouragement. But th that could also work both ways. And I know people are, not, you know, we, we speak about introverts and extroverts. When it comes to social media, there's also introverts and extroverts. There's people that right. are afraid to put their stuff out there, but are writing constantly so uh, i always mention the famous example of percy shelley so we uh, a lot of people don't still don't know who percy shelley is but there's a person we all know who uh, which is mary shelley the author of frankenstein right so the right. frankenstein the book right. was written by mary shelley and she was married to percy shelley uh, and percy shelley was not known for his work so he was not only a poet, but also a genius in the sense that he analyzed poetry to the point of, you know, insane critique. So he would write essays about what poetry is, where the you know divide between prose and poetry and what real poetry is. Uh, but yeah, so nobody knew him in his lifetime. It was only after his death that Mary Shelley, his wife, publicized his works and his essays were published and his poetry was published. And, and then, you know, 50, 60 years ago, he was known as the greatest, you know, uh, greatest uh, uh i can't even think anymore greatest poet of his time uh and and people you know academically analyze whether he had a bigger influence on english literature than shakespeare himself so you know this is a person that never ever lived through his praise you know he never ever you know survived it yeah so yeah, at the end of the day your poetry doesn't necessarily need to be something that is praise. You don't even need to read that praise. But if you if you you know if you develop your writing, it, it will be read at one point or another, whether it's after your death or in your lifetime. Um, and yeah, so I used to be of the opinion of you know just put it out there because I've learned in the last two years that putting it out there does propel you, right. elevate you, you know, give you the 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 pedestal that you need. But it, I was thinking the other day, what if I didn't develop that body of work behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Would I still be in that same position? Mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, you know, can be questioned. Well, what do you think, like, like uh, poets coming up should, yeah, like, have in mind about social media? Because you have this, uh, this wave of social media poets, even in our community, and everyone's just trying to post as, as fast as possible. Um, and 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 sometimes you fall into that trap. It's like, oh, you got to post every day or every other day, or you know. As, at some point you don't post and I think people have this mentality where if you don't post you don't feel relevant and, and, you know, and your posts are getting out there which is obviously not a good mentality to have so how, how do you overcome that social media vice that you fall into that a lot of people fall into where you're being demanded almost to, to, to create something but there's no cup to create it from if that makes sense do you know what I mean yeah no, 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 I wouldn't call it a vice per se but like you know naturally so Instagram social media has you know have their own algorithms right but we've also created our own algorithms ourselves where we we write to specific occasions on specific days, whether it's Eid, we'll write about the crescent moon, whether it's this, we'll write. Uh, it's, it's both healthy and unhealthy because it's healthy because it acts as a sort of prompt and, and prompts in poetry are very useful, you know, development tools because it's like times if, of if you prayer, right? Do you want to push toward yeah. uh, to do something important, basically, or to do something in yeah, terms yeah. of your growth? Yeah, no, but when they teach you poetry, they often give you something what's called a writing prompt. So they give you a topic uh, and you write to it. So in a, in a weird, wonderful way, these events, uh, this drive to kind of put our poetry out there acts as a prompt. So there is development inside it, but it also makes it artificial in a sense of when if we go back to the ego or uh, a readiness to please others, that's where we need to start questioning ourselves, mm. where, where writing but how much of this writing is to please others. And we all, you know, we're all guilty of trying to please others in one form or another. But right. with creatives, it's, it's even more murky than that because you're trying, it's a balancing book of, I want to get my poem out there and I've got 24 hour window. 
because if I don't beat this 24 hour window, nobody's going to read it because it's not, not relevant for the topic. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that's my thought on it. Again, I'm, I'm no preacher. I don't know the answer to that, but it's definitely worth reflecting on everything we do as creatives because, you know, the longer your journey goes, you know, the, lo- the bigger the following and people, right. you know, will witness you and, 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 tr- you know, I wouldn't say idea, but, but take you as a role model of sorts. So if you start acting as a way in a certain way, creative, other pe- people that try to follow your journey will do the same. Um, and then you, before you know it, you've created monsters, uh, because everybody's trying to follow you in a certain way, but you've got it all wrong. Now, how do you That's tell it. all these people that, Hey, I've got it all wrong, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but it's, yeah. we, you know, yeah, it's a blessing. Like going back to an early question of, you know, we've inadvertently opened the door for other like-minded creatives. Right. Um, there's, it's a responsibility that we have to bear as well, because, and this is coming from, you know, uh, from a zero ego perspective, because at the end of the day, what others do in following us reflects badly on us. Right. Uh, and if you've created, you know, um, not created, uh, if you've written in a, say, a provocative fashion and other poets that take you as a role model start to write provocatively as well, then you've created this spiral of Chinese whispers where eventually mm. it reaches out of control. And now you've got very vile content being spread about. And there's, I'm not getting into specific examples, but it then isolates the same community that you try to take, you know, drag out of the bubble right. because it brings them back into the bubble because of your bad habits. Uh, but you yeah, know, we all learn from each other. It's like a circle. So, so we, I, I wouldn't say we're pioneers when it comes to that because I learn from very junior, you know, novice poets out there, uh, and I, I like the way they write. I like the way they think, and I'm thinking, yeah, I should bring that into my poetry as well. That kind of thinking. So there's, it works both ways. Um, but you know, that we we always have to shoulder some 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 sort of responsibility. You know, just to, just to really quickly mention this, that everything you just said it kind of just reminded me of this one quote out of nowhere, he who loves the artist glorifies the art. Um, and it's just like, you know, I just wanted to mention that before Nuri closes it off. Beautiful. With an epic quote. Epic quote. But I appreciate you, bro. Thank you, thank you for your time. Uh, it's honestly, uh, all friendship uh, aside, uh, it's, been, it's, been, it's been wonderful to have you on. I really appreciate <laughs> uh, you taking from your time. It's been very beneficial. Um, just you know anyone who uh, wants to reach out to you or find your work online or, or purchase your your book uh, where can they find you and what projects do you have coming up where can they find me write my name uh on social media and you'll find me words about Tahar, uh is my handle and i think that's my handle across social media i think facebook has something different um upcoming work i've got four manuscripts uh all different timelines i was hoping you know to launch and publish all of them in 2022 but then i realized i have no control over external publishers and it's all down to their you know internal mechanisms but i think the first one would be a project called the names and a lot of us as uh that you know a lot of the people that follow me on on instagram have seen this manifest and come to uh fall come to open up a on, on Instagram. So these are Arabic words for different things. So the 11 names of the moon, the 14 names of love, and it's right. a poetic conversation with the etymology of the Arabic language. Uh, and it's done in a very unique uh, and poetic way. And that is due to be translated, I suspect, before it's published in the English language. So, so for the Arabic speakers, they'll probably get access to a translated version which is to be published in the UAE um, sometime end of 2022. And I'm hoping the original will follow suit soon after, if not before, but I haven't been given news about exact dates. And then for the Islamic audience, we've got the chosen names. Um, The chosen names are also, you know, born out of Instagram. Uh, So these are the names of Islamic figures. Uh, that are very well known um, and explores, 
again, the etymology of their names. So it's very similar to the, the names, but this one's the chosen names, and this is to be published uh, in, uh, I, I don't know the exact date, but it will be published by an Islamic publisher that has approached me. Um, and then you've got, I don't know what language I dream in. So that is yeah, my favorite of the collection. So this, so this is going to be an identity collection. Um, so this looks at my life. If anybody is interested in my, um, in knowing more about my life, <laughs> have a cover of chicken on it. <laughs> it's going to have a cover of chicken. I don't know what chicken I eat, um, but you know, it's I don't know what language I dream in, and that's going to look at everything from mother languages, mother tongue, sorry, to grappling with uh, sects and religion. To uh, it was it was originally titled Pilgrim because it was a kind of a pilgrimage of, of my journey in identity. But recently, I've discovered that the whole thing can be translated into. I don't know what language I dream. So this is a, it's probably the most exciting of the three projects because it's going to be very different. Um, and then you've got a pet project, which hopefully is going to be a charitable project. Uh, and that is the 99 names of God in poetic uh, fashion. So that's, um, you, that's also on Instagram. So a lot of the work is actually derived from the body of work I share on Instagram. And I think that would be actually a good piece of advice for a lot of people where have that in mind when you share on Instagram, don't share things for the sake of sharing them. Rather work both ways, yeah. make sure that you're in the background, keeping check of what you can put in, into manuscripts, um, what you can share and get published in journals. Uh, so I was consciously thinking of exploring uh, these projects as published projects, but I thought while I write them, let me share them uh, and so that's worked in my favor so it was two birds with one stone so those are the four projects that hopefully will all be launched 2022 2023 at the very latest um, yeah so exciting times going from one book in god knows how many years 20 years to four in a, a year and a bit so Beautiful. it's yeah Mashallah. Well Tara, appreciate you, bro. Thank Shall you. I'll see you again uh, within five Inshallah. minutes. Of <laughs> 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 Thank you, Thank you both. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely.